thank you all so much for having me to talk tonight. I mean, I feel a bit of a fraud in many ways because I know that a lot of you are such illustrious underwater photographers uh, yourselves. I've uh, seen some of your work, obviously, and heard of lots of you, and uh, I see your work and I absolutely love it. So uh, I hope what I say isn't going to be too sort of rudimentary for you all and there's something of note in here. But uh, as you can see, the title is From Jaws to Banning Straws how shark photography changed my life but i'm not going to lecture you on banning straws don't worry about that um but i'm gonna hopefully show you how through taking photographs of sharks myself um my, my views of sharks and certainly uh, marine conservation changed so moving on just a little bit about me um before we begin um I'm a marine photographer, that's what I call myself, because I don't just do underwater, I also do some landscapes and lots of topsides. Um, because I work with sharks a lot and great whites quite a lot, as you'll see going through, uh, and maybe some pictures of mine that you've seen, um, there are a lot of topside shots of white sharks, as well as the underwater. I'd say underwater photography is probably the bit that I enjoy the most, the biggest challenge and my favourite part of it, but um, trying to represent these animals quite often, particularly with great whites, uh, you do need to do some topside work as well. Um, I'm from the UK, as you can hear from my accent, and that's why it's really nice to talk to you all, because um, I don't normally get a chance to connect that well with um, UK underwater photographers, and yet there's such a rich um, um, amount of people doing it. Um, and as I said before, I love all I love all the work that I see, so this is lovely for me to be able to connect and reach out. So, yeah, I'm, I'm from the UK, but I've mainly worked abroad, and that's mainly in South Africa, and then. Um, in the States, uh, mainly down in Florida and also in the Bahamas. Uh, so all pretty sharky places uh, that have attracted me there to photograph them. Um, I've been published um, by, among others, National Geographic, the BBC, Discovery, Disney, Geo Magazine, Africa Geographic, WWF, Random House, so on and so forth. So I've been in lots of things, um, I suppose, over the years. Um, uh, newspapers, magazines, ad agencies by my work, um, that's what it tends to sort of get used for. And I do do this commercially and um, until the pandemic happened, it was the lion's share of my income. So um, we'll see if we can carry on doing that once the world gets back to normal. Um, I've been doing this since about, 19, since about uh, 2010. Um, I do a mix of commission work, I do self-funded things that I pitch and also stock photography and also increasingly with the way that the channels work with distributing our work, um, having to diversify revenue streams. Um, so for instance, um, getting a lot more cute with social media and things like that, as I'm sure you all are that try and sell your work. There's so many avenues you can sell it um, through and so many different ways of raising revenue from through your photography that it's not just stock and things like that anymore, um, which often requires new skills and takes up a lot of time um, to learn. But as I said, I primarily concentrate on sharks. Um, the reason for that is that it's my biggest interest. And secondly, I was given some advice when I started uh, that I should concentrate um, on a niche. Um, a lot of people that were already in the industry said try and pick a niche, so try and stick to sharks and then you'll be the guy people think of when they want a shark picture and they'll call you. Um, and that has sort of worked. Uh, I've never really regretted doing that and I suppose I am particularly thought of as a shark photographer. Um, I've worked also a lot with science projects and charities, uh, particularly in South Africa, um, for both sharks and whales. Um, and also my work has appeared quite a lot in peer reviewed journals, articles and that sort of thing. And I'm quite proud of that work. I'm proud that I've been trusted by people doing these sort of projects um, to illustrate their work and things like that. Uh, so that's always a real thrill for me to work with projects like um, charities and scientists. Um, I, was in a, I was in South Africa for eight years. Um, it's quite a strange story, really. I only went over there for a month. Um, I was just desperate to see a great white shark. It, it had always been my ambition. I wasn't um, particularly happy with my life at the time in the UK and the uh, career I was in. So I went over to South Africa for a month and um, that was it. I stayed for eight, eight years, give or take, and got into doing this completely different sort of Thing to what I was doing before. Um, 
it just seduced me so much. I loved working with the shark so much, the lifestyle, uh, the the people I worked with, going to see every day. Uh, it was just something that I had to do. I, I thought it was like a, a calling to me and uh, I just did everything in my power to stay doing that. Um, and then, as I said, a couple of years um, after I left there in the Bahamas and South Florida up until the pandemic. Do I just need to minimize, sorry, I just moved this out of the way so I can see what I'm doing. Right. Um, I'd also like to talk about my scuba diving um, history and career because I think it's so important for underwater photography. In a way, with this group, I think I'm um, teaching Granny to suck eggs a bit because um, I've noticed in the UK, divers are generally very well trained um, and um, they're much more seriously trained than a lot of the ones that I've come across abroad because that certainly isn't the case in lots of the places where I've worked and obviously diving is a critical component of underwater photography in terms of the technique and your skills and so I take dive training incredibly seriously myself I'm an instructor and I do continual training um, and it's just a point that I reiterate to people who maybe want to do what I do um, it's get your diving down first. As I say, we're very fortunate in this country to have very well-trained divers, and I'm sure all of you are, but uh, I just noticed that abroad, uh, particularly in South Africa and in parts of Florida, people strap a tank on, they jump in and they don't really care. And then they get a camera and they say, well, you know, why is my photography not going well? And oftentimes um, the problems can be solved by improving the diving before you're thinking about the photography. So that's why this part's in the course, um, talk, sorry. Um, it's all about control, isn't it? As, as you all know, the better control you have um, in the water, um, the easier it is to take the pictures. You can think less about your diving and your positioning and just do that subconsciously and concentrate much more on your subject, uh, the background and your camera controls. Um, and in addition to that, and probably the most important thing in all of this is that uh, you're less likely to harm the environment or frighten the wildlife. Um, I see a lot of shark photographers underwater who are so fixated on the animal that they're not seeing the reef that, 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 that they're kicking or the fact that they're scaring the sharks. They can often tear after them and you see the fins go down and um, yeah, so it's crucial that you're a good responsible scuba diver uh, if you're doing this. Um, I think of it as an essential part of the toolkit that you're offering to your clients. Um, I, I always think commercially in these ways and just as important as what camera you're using, what gear you've got, is how well you dive. Um, obviously, good buoyancy and finning technique are the main things. You've got to learn to back kick really if you can. Um, that's so helpful in underwater photography. And um, yeah, I just, I always stress that the most important part of underwater photography, as well as the camera, is being a good scuba diver, as I'm sure you, you all know. Okay, so why do I photograph sharks? And um, really, it's been a lifelong fascination for me. Um, I started out in South Africa as a small child. My parents had a contract there, and we went to Durban to the aquarium, and I saw sharks. Um, so that would have been before I was five years old and I was just fascinated by them from then onwards. Then of course, you know, you see Jaws, uh, which was a big film back then. Uh, uh, hence this photograph, which is my most Jawsy one, I suppose, if you'll excuse it. Um, and that started for me this absolute lifelong fascination with sharks. I couldn't believe that they were real and I couldn't believe that such things existed. They just were endlessly fascinating. And um, from that, I got lots of picture books. In those days, we didn't we didn't have the internet and we didn't have television on demand and I had lots and lots of picture books. And um, that's really what got me into thinking about sharks and photography, I guess, almost subconsciously as a child, I used to look at these photographs and they were my access to sharks. And so why I photograph sharks is because of that fascination and because I think they're genuinely beautiful things. It's pathetically, a lot of them, um, the fact that they are so evolved and their um, form mirrors their function, I just find that wonderful. I know some people don't and they think they're hideous things, but for me, that aspect of them, I just think they're endlessly beautiful. Um, and I love to photograph them just for that reason, uh, the aesthetics of them. Um, they're also a great thing to photograph because there's lots of species 
lots of different ones. If you compare, for instance, a shy shark to a whale shark and then everything in between, I mean, there are so many different shapes and sizes and also locations. So it's a really good excuse to um, get around the world taking photographs um, because there are still just about sharks all over the world um, and so many endless ones to photograph. It's also increasingly popular, I find. I mean, I, I've always thought sharks appealed to some people and were popular amongst certain subsets but as we can see now with shark week um, they seem to be very mainstream at the moment very popular and that's I guess suited me in the last 10 years in my career that they've become more popular and more people are interested in them um, we're going to talk a little bit about photos like this one you're seeing here and why maybe the commercial side of this isn't the ideal one um, but yes certainly they are commercially viable if you're photographing them um, quite often I can I can still manage to sell photographs of sharks and to lots of different places as you saw with my client list um, and then the last reason is and um, the, the whole banning straws aspect of this is that sharks are in peril um, they're they're a lot of them are threatened species um, we as humans are doing a terrible job um, and we're wiping them out and the the speed in which we're doing that if you look at the last 30 years for instance um, how we decimated populations of sharks um, they need our help and as we're going to discuss in a moment I think photography is a good vehicle to help Okay, so I mentioned that I used to pore over picture books and um, things like that when I was a child looking at sharks and I vividly remember all of the photographs and all of the photographers that were an influence on me and still are and you might see some of those influences just, just from these pictures here we're looking at but I've just picked out some names here, there's many more but these were the big ones that I just remember seeing time and time again and they just absolutely captivated me. So, so James D. Watt who's uh, sadly no longer with us he took that very famous picture the uh, top side shot of the shark with the open mouth and you got ron and valerie taylor of course um, who did so many documentaries but also photographs as well david dubelay who was so important with his work with national geographic in showing people sharks um, for the first time almost um, jim abernethy in the states who um, has also done a lot particularly with tiger sharks and species like that in the tropics um, he's also been very instrumental and a big influence on me. Marty Snyderman too, I just loved his work and Jeff Rotman. Uh, but there are so many others as well. I mean, the list goes on and on. And then up to the present day, I, I think we're li we are so lucky to live in a time when we've got so many avenues for people to share their photography, um, much better equipment than we've ever had in the past. So more people doing it, um, easier access. And so um, we are spoilt in many ways that we get to see so many wonderful photographs now. Um, way more than we ever had i mean if you go on if you go on instagram for instance you are going to see so many new shark photos a day it's quite staggering but it's also a brilliant thing too so why did i start photographing them um as i said i went over to south africa and i was only going to stay there for a month as a volunteer but i quickly realized that no this is what i wanted to do this is where i wanted to work i wanted to work with these animals and i wanted to work with these people um, and the trouble is i'm not a scientist and i couldn't really think what i had to offer but i'd always been a very avid amateur photographer i've been i've been um, a, a hobbyist photographer since i was about five years old got my first camera at, at five and always been a mad, a mad amateur photographer and that's why I thought, well, I'm sure that I can try this. I didn't know if I'd be any good at it, but I thought, well, I'll try and capture these animals and try and copy those influences that I'd seen before. And that was a sort of a dream occupation to me at the time. I didn't realize you could actually really do this. Um, the other thing was that when I got to South Africa, um, still photography had really fallen out of favor. Maybe about 10 years before you had people like Amos Nakum and people there who were doing it and maybe had, rather saturated the market for Hans Bai and still photography and Guadalupe was um, kicking off at the time and so it, there was much more video and much more of the, of the motion work going on in, in Hans Bai in South Africa where I was uh, rather than still photography and I saw it as a sort of opportunity I, I thought well there's a gap for me um, particularly as companies seem to always need new images for their marketing and also um, the internet was really becoming important to their businesses too and social media so that there was 
there was a place for me, uh, luckily, when I got there, and uh, that's what I exploited. But then I realised that I was only recording a minuscule aspect of sharks' lives by going on shark cage diving boats and taking pictures of white sharks when they poke their heads out of the water. Um, so that's a tiny part of what they do. It's a split second, really, in their lives that I was capturing, and I just wanted to do... Um, I, I wanted to represent them more, and so that's when I began underwater photography. And, of course, we all know... Um, what a rabbit hole that is once you start doing that and uh, and so then it began this this crazy world that we're all in um, with these contraptions with dome ports and strobe arms and uh, yeah all the fun begins. Um, I also found I was doing more work with the scientists and NGOs I was just referring to um, and able to travel to more locations around um, Africa uh, particularly up north in South Africa um, to do more sort of tropical uh, species um, and so my work expanded and so did my clients um, and very much because I'd shifted to doing underwater as well as the top side there just really weren't that many people doing it there but of course once you start to dive more experience the underwater world wherever you are i think and i've noticed it everywhere i've been um be it reefs or the animals themselves the wildlife um you quickly realize that um the underwater environment is in trouble and i realized that sharks are in trouble um, and of course by working with the scientific groups too um i got to see more of that in a um a data driven driven way um and of course then you want to help and um, sharks face multiple threats. Um, they're very slow to reproduce, which tends to compound the problems. Um, and they face multiple, multiple threats. So, for instance, overfishing and bycatch, which um, often happens in unregulated parts of the open ocean. We all probably know about the shark finning problem, um, where sharks are caught for shark fin soup and they have their fins cut off and the rest of them thrown away, often to deal with quotas of not taking the whole shark back again. Um, and these get sold for shark fin soup. They don't actually taste of anything, but it drives an industry because it's a luxury product in parts of the Far East. Um, habitat loss, climate change. I mean, this is, this is also the banning straws part, plastics. All of these um, human pressures that we're putting on the animals, um, they all contribute to the conservation puzzle that we've got to solve with sharks. Um, the figure that gets bandied around is that um, 100 million sharks killed a year, um, and I used to use that term, but a lot of scientists have corrected me and said if only there were that many left to be catching, so um, that shows the state of the problem. Some species have lost between 70 and 90 percent of, of their populations since the 1970s, for instance oceanic white tips almost decimated and they used to be the most abundant large animal in the sea. So. Um, these are the problems we face, as I say. Um, another problem we used to find in, in Hans by was just poaching. Um, white sharks' jaws are worth about $10,000, and so um, people used to catch white sharks just for the jaws. And the numbers of white sharks around South Africa are so low that you cannot stand to lose animals in this way. So that, that was another very immediate thing to me there, um, a, a problem that I could see with my own eyes. I was offered teeth in bars and things like that, and it, it just really shocked me. So again, I sort of put my crusader hat on and decided that I was gonna take photographs that um, helped. And here we have a photograph, maybe that is along those lines. This is um, a, quite a graphic image of a black tip shark taken at the Aliwal Shoal, um, and that's had a hook ripped from its mouth. And that's going to be a devastating injury for that shark. It will probably um, en end up with a jaw deformity, and um, Obviously, it's it's a wild animal. It can't afford that sort of uh, disability and survive. Um, a very good book, if you're interested in this subject, on shark conservation, because uh, I don't have time really to go into that here, otherwise I'd use the whole talk. But um, there's a book by um, an author called William McKeever called Emperors of the Deep, um, which is a very good snapshot, I think, of the current state of of shark conservation and shark threats. So if anybody's looking for a book, it's also very well written. He's a good author, so it's a, it's a good book. And I recommend that one if you want a snapshot on conservation issues at the moment with sharks. This photograph shows, and uh, Donovan was there, I think, when we, uh, when we did this. This was um, 
the problem that they have in the Cape in South Africa at the moment with um, dead white sharks washing up um, that appear to be being targeted by orca who have learned how to put them on their backs, pull their pectoral fins um, and uh, rupture their rupture their breasts if you like and um, that allows their liver to float out which the orcas then eat. Um, and this was from a necropsy on the first one that washed up there. Uh, this was a large, almost five metre uh, white shark. And you can see them doing the necropsy there, uh, where they established, first of all, that uh, orcas were responsible. And you could actually see the strakes. But the, the point of this is to A, show that um, I've done photojournalism work with uh, these kind of uh, groups, but also um, to show um, a different style of photography. I mean, this is this is um, this is not just underwater. It's it's not showing sharks looking pretty. This is this is trying to illustrate um, a conservation point because we believe the orcas are probably doing this because of human pressures elsewhere. Um, it's it's a controversial subject, but at present we believe that perhaps uh, they're not getting access to their um, usual food, and so they've learnt and adapted to. to do this with the white sharks because their um, livers are very nutritious. This is another photograph um, that perhaps illustrates one aspect of conservation photography. It's another graphic image showing a hook through the eye of a blue shark uh, that again I took in South Africa off Cape Point and that photograph was taken about 40 miles out to sea and we used to see the long lining boats there. You would dive with maybe 40 or 50 blue sharks one day, you'd see the boats appear and the next time you went out there would be no sharks or one or two with injuries like this. And an image like this is quite eye-catching I believe and this is really where we come in as photographers sometimes. It's that photography is a powerful medium, it, it can make an impact. Um, we can all record and report back what we see through our photos. Um, and especially as I alluded to before, with so many channels now available to instantly publish them around the world. Um, and what's more, it, they don't have to be graphic pictures like the one on the previous slide or this one with the hook. I appreciate they're not for everybody and some people don't want to see these sort of images, but you can also just show the, the beauty of sharks as well or, or whatever animal you're trying to um, portray the conservation aspect of. Often the best tactic is just to show the beauty of them and I do try and do that a lot too. So it's not just about these graphic images, although I think that they have their place. It's also um, it's good just, just to show these animals in their environment doing what they do. Um, in shark tourism, when we were in South Africa, because I also did work in the cage diving industry for a while, we used to find that often the truth speaks for itself. People would come and they would think they were going to be meeting jaws and what they would meet wasn't jaws, but it was just as exciting and they'd leave with a fresh appreciation but probably more excited by great white sharks than the monster that they were expecting to come and see. Um, the real thing really is more fascinating and so with my photos what I hope to do is make them more accessible, make sharks more accessible, show them how they are, show them to people um, either as I said before just doing their thing looking natural or um, with these sort of more graphic images um, and to, we're doing that because I want to enable people to appreciate them and to care about sharks you can't protect something you don't care about and so along with the photos I also often have um, text that goes with them and I'm just all the time trying to help people appreciate sharks so they'll care about them and I often want to start a debate or open a, a, a discussion about them we're going to see in a moment um, a, an open mouth shot, as we call them, um, of great white of a great white shark, um, and I'm going to discuss that in more detail. But yeah, I find that it can be a gateway into discussing sharks. Sometimes you need an image that's maybe more sensational to bring people in to then get your message across, um, and that message is often to highlight the problems that sharks are facing. Um, it's a very pressing issue at the moment. Time's running out. We're wiping them out very very fast, and uh, we have no time to lose. So. Yeah, we do need to get on this. So as I said, I do try and take photographs that um, aren't graphic or sensational like that last one, and I hope this one illustrates this sort of image. Um, this is a shark in evening light with dappled light, just swimming around, minding its own business, and I do try and do a lot of this sort of image too, 
um, perhaps to some people less exciting, but I hope the beauty comes across and people can see this animal in its own environment, just doing its thing. And I hope that makes people start to care about them. This was in the Alleywell Shoal, by the way, it was an evening dive. And I was just in the water on my own and I just remember it so well. It was a beautiful dive. The animal was so relaxed, um, not threatening in any way. And it was just absolutely wonderful. And I got quite a few pictures that I was pleased with with it because it was a superb model and the light was very nice. And that's, that's the boat I was just about to get into above us. And here's another one, uh, sort of more of a photojournalistic sort of picture. And this one has sort of made the press and that sort of thing. Um, this is removing a hook from a shark. I think this is quite important as well to show that, you know, work does um, go on to help these animals. Um, and this is um, a gentleman called Walter Bernardis who's put this shark into tonic immobility. That's when you put the animal onto its back and it goes into a sort of almost trance-like state. And that way then they can try and remove hooks that are embedded in the jaw as cleanly and safely as possible so that the shark has a chance and it doesn't become deformed or what have you with the sharks in there. Um, and I just include this picture because um, I just think it shows uh, that's that sort of photography that I do um, underwater photojournalism. Okay, and here we go. This is what I alluded to before. This is two photographs of white sharks and white sh sharks in many ways are my stock in trade because I spent eight years in the great white capital of the world in Hans Bay in South Africa. I've probably photographed these more than any other species. On the left, we have what we call the open mouth shot, as I said, uh, maybe the classic image, the, the scary monster image of a great white shark. And then on the right, we have what I believe is the opposite to that. Um, it's just a white shark in beautiful clear water, just gliding effortlessly, not looking aggressive. And this brings up a real debate, I think, um, that a lot of shark photographers have to have to think about, um, because the image on the left is the commercial image. You can sell that photograph every single time, but it doesn't overturn stereotypes necessarily. It perpetuates the negative stereotypes of sharks. Um, and of course, from a conservation perspective, that's not the issue that we want. That's not the image that we want to portray. But then again, the image on the left will sell. Uh, sorry, the image on the right will sell much, much less than the image on the left hand side. So what do we do about it? Well, I think that as photographers, we could stop taking that sort of photograph and pretend it doesn't happen. But at the end of the day, that is a feature of the animal. The animal does do that. It does have fascinating jaws. Um, they are amazing predators. And therefore, maybe we can harness it by taking that sensationalism and um, using it as a gateway. And so what I do a lot is I'll put an image like that in, but I'll also put it with an image like the one on the right. And then I will discuss it or I'll ask people to say what they think of it. Or I will explain that it's that the image on the left is a split second in time and that that's not how sharks are for the majority of their lives and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's very important to tell the whole truth of the animal. And within that context, we can say, yes, this animal is a very powerful hunter. Um, it does have very efficient teeth and jaws, and we can talk about those because they are fascinating, but we use it as a gateway in to talk about sharks. And again, we're using photography to grab people's attention and then maybe get our message in. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a little while, um, about the sort of the possible echo chamber of people that are just into sharks and not getting out to the wider audience. But yes, it is something that I do think about a lot, should I be sharing these kind of pictures with the open mouths? And I'd be very interested in when we do the Q&A uh, section to hear what other people think about whether or not it's justified. Because sometimes I'm not sure it is, and I do, I do worry about it a lot. Um, it is something that plays on my mind. Uh, but at the same time, those sort of images have been commercially pretty successful for me. Um, and I can't deny that they've enabled me to keep going, maybe to doing other forms of photography, um, other forms of shark photography too. So yeah, it's, it's always an interesting conundrum and um, not necessarily one with a straightforward answer. And uh, that, that leads on a bit to ethics in general of shark diving, um, which I think are becoming quite pressing because of um, the increased number of people who dive with, who, who do dive with sharks, many of whom are photographers. Um, I obviously go on lots of shark dives all over the world, or did before the pandemic, uh, lots of different 
um, places, operators, species, and the one thing in common is there's always a bunch of underwater photographers there. And, um, and, so, and so we as photographers, I think, need to think about the ethics of this and our ethics. Um, and again, like the previous slide, this is something that I do think about a lot, and maybe my views are changing a bit. Um, the, the pro points of shark diving are that it shows sharks firsthand to people and maybe helps dispel the myth that they're not just bloodthirsty monsters, they're going to instantly attack you if you get in the water. Most encounters with sharks, as I'm sure you all know, because it seems when uh, from the chat before uh, we started this that many of you dive with sharks. Um, they are nothing like people think they are as a rule. They're quite calm, they're quite cautious things as a rule, and we have to bring them in with um, a bait the majority of the time. Um, the other good thing with shark diving is that it makes the animals worth more alive than dead. If you fish a shark out, it's 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 used once and that's the value done. Whereas if you're diving with sharks, um, particularly in places like Jupiter or Aliwell Shoal, where you're diving with the same ones quite often, and and also the Bahamas where they're protected and places like that, then these animals become worth a lot of money as a tourist um, as a tourist thing. So um, it's definitely more economically viable to keep them alive and dive with them than just to fish them out once. Although often, obviously, the people doing these activities are from completely different spectrums and one doesn't think about the other. But yeah, in, in general, one of the boons of shark diving is that it makes the sharks worth more alive than dead. Natural or baited shark dives, uh, that's an interesting point. Um, it's very hard to get a lot of these species to come to you unless you put some stimuli in the water that will attract them. Um, I think there's a big difference between a nat natural dive and a baited one. A baited one is completely unnatural. Um, you, are, you are altering things and as uh, photographers and divers, ethically we have to consider whether or not that's a good thing. Um, I think it to some extent depends on where you're doing it. Again, places like Jupiter or Aliwal Shoal, where you're going to the same places with often the same populations of sharks, there is a danger you can change their behavior and condition them. Whereas I think with some of the pelagic species where you're gonna see that shark, it's maybe never seen a human before in its life and it might never see one again because they swim into such great expanses. It's not such a pressing thing to use a bait. Um, but again, these are just questions that we all need to think about from now on uh, when we are doing these activities. Um, how is this for the animal? How is this for the environment? Um, and how are we affecting them? One of the big criticisms always is that by doing these activities, sharks begin to associate humans with food. Um, and as I explained just then, I think in some places that could be true. Um, I've certainly seen conditioned sharks in Aliwal Shoal and in Jupiter. Um, the other problem as well is accidents, because these are wild animals you're working with. And I think that a lot of people are getting quite blasé because there's so much shark diving going on in some of these places. I think people are getting quite blasé and they are wild animals. They're often around a food source and uh, things can go wrong. It also doesn't help when operators play fast and loose. If you look at this photograph here, there's a spear gun hanging up there next to the bait drum. And I've seen them shoot fish during a shark dive there to put in the bait drum, which is the, the most irresponsible, ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Um, and so you have to ask yourself also, as well as the ethics, uh, um, are, the are the operators I'm going with reputable? I'm not gonna mention these guys' names, but um, I don't think these particular ones were reputable by doing that sort of thing. So research who you're going with there's always lots of um, lots of other people who've already been with operators you can find out a lot about the operators and just make sure they've got the shark's best interest at heart because were there an accident and the shark bit somebody the shark gets the blame usually not the operator we must be mindful for our safety and also that of the sharks themselves and now on to shark cage diving, which was the, the big ecotourism activity where I was living in France by. And here's a picture I took from a cage of a, of a white shark. Uh, again, quite a dramatic shot, but perhaps not um, the whole truth of the, of the activity. Um, the camera can lie, and in this case, I think it, it does. Usually white sharks don't do this and come and mouth the cage and things like that. Um, it, it, that's quite a rare occurrence. Um, but there are similar concerns with this activity. Um, at, the, at the same time as it changes people's perceptions of white sharks, um, does it condition the sharks? Um, are these sharks going to associate 
humans with food? Are we going to wind them up by teasing them with a bait? You wouldn't go to the Kruger Park in Africa and drag a piece of meat behind the truck in front of a lion and keep pulling it away like we do with shark cage diving. So again, all questions we need to ask. And, um, and ones that I became more unsure about the longer I was in South Africa, and I still haven't completely made up my mind what I think about it. Because it does change many perceptions. As I said, people come on the boats and you educate them about the animals and they leave with a newfound respect for the animal and an interest in them. And it makes the sharks worth a lot economically, which they're not once caught once, as we said. So, again, these are all difficult conundrums and ones I think that we need to solve. But as photographers, I think we do need to think about them and we need to wonder if we're encouraging um, some practices at these industries. In South Africa, there's actually, um, there are regulations and most of the operators now do stick to them. Things like, you know, not dragging the sharks into the cage um, for, for the viewer's entertainment, not, uh, not letting them get the um, the fish if they can help it, uh, the tuna heads and that sort of thing, trying to control the situation. Um, and then just moving on to what I was saying before about the echo chamber. Um, I think that a lot of times, um, a lot of underwater photographers tend to um, communicate with other underwater photographers and shark fans do too, and there's some overlap, but maybe not a lot. And I do wonder sometimes if, we're all in a big echo chamber and so when we think we're getting the message out about conservation and sharks and um, that sort of thing whether or not we're just talking to ourselves uh, a lot of us have the same views anyway so that's just one thing that I try and break out of um, and that's again why sometimes I use these these eye-catching and sensationalist images to try and break out of that and draw people in and then you can hit them with the message and the other problem with social media I think is that there are just so many people that have interest in sharks setting up pages and groups and that sort of thing that maybe aren't qualified, um, that aren't um, biologists and what have you, and so are maybe spreading misinformation. Um, and we need to be mindful of that too. So I think it's, it's our responsibility as photographers when we put information out to try and be as accurate as we can be. So if we're describing our pictures or describing a situation to try and be honest and uh, also check our facts. Okay, so now I'm going to get more onto some of my pictures and um, just talk about some of the techniques and um, some of the um, experiences when taking them. I mean, first of all, I'm going to talk about the gear as well, because you might be interested in that, although I haven't changed my gear for quite a while, so yours is probably all much newer than mine. But um, this is a good example of using a lens to good advantage. This is, um, I use Canon SLR cameras um, pretty exclusively, have them uh, for a long time. I use Nauticam housings, and uh, predominantly I use wide angle lenses. So um, this would have been with the 8 to 15 fish I zoom, the Canon L1. And this shows um, how you can ma manipulate a lens to really give a nice effect to an image. I think this is, I always think this looks a bit like a shark on the moon, um, but it's taking a very sort of like a featureless landscape or seascape if you like, and, um, and it's making it more interesting by putting the curve on it, but by keeping the shark in the middle of the frame, it's not as distorted. So that's just one way that sort of manipulating it to perhaps bring some interest to the image. Um, and using a lens to your advantage. And this is in a similar vein. This is obviously a fisheye lens, but this is getting very close up to a ragged tooth shark in Aliwal Shoal at the cathedral dive site, which uh, if you haven't been there, I definitely recommend. It's about 30 meters and for some of the year when the sharks go there to mate, um, it's a brilliant place to photograph. Um, ragged tooth sharks or sand tigers or grey nurses as you might call them and this again is using a lens to uh, it, its advantage and really playing on the distortion I think of getting that close um, and I think it made an unusual image that perhaps isn't like a lot of other ones that you see of this animal. Um, to me its long nose was always a big feature of it um, and so I really wanted to accentuate that and that's what I did here and yes you can see the teeth as well and also the eye but um, yeah it's like a caricature for me of the animal and I quite like what what, what, what the lens did. Um, I'm always quite mindful, I'm sure you are too, of what your lens does in terms of the perspective and the distortions and using those rather than often trying to um, disguise them, I like to use them. 
I also shoot wide. This is rectilinear. This is from the sardine run, which is going on at the moment. And I'm very jealous I'm not there this year. Um, and this was of a bait ball with a lot of sharks around it and um, gannets hitting it from the top. Um, and a few divers there to put some context on it. And this shot was about as wide as I could go and all natural light, just showing that um, you, know, you can do all different styles with this, with just two lenses. I, I just use a fisheye and a rectilinear wide angle. Um, for, the, for the majority of the underwater work I do. And uh, yeah, this just shows a very different sort of look to the ones before. This is a split, obviously. Um, I do like doing splits a lot. And uh, with white sharks that come to the surface and play on the surface with you, uh, um, this is one that, um, this is an approach that I look, quite like to take. I've got lots of split shots of white sharks and ones like this, which is sort of almost a split that I think is quite interesting showing a bit of the environment above the water, but also the shark underneath. Um, it's quite funny, when I first went out to South Africa trying to get this sort of shot, um, I, ha I didn't really know about pole cams. I was so green and new to this, and this picture I think was taken in about 20, 2010, 2011. I was so new to this that I didn't know what to do. And so what we used to have happen is that one of the guys on the boat would hold me sort of over the side and let me dip the front half of my body into the water in front of the shark and then the skipper of the boat would call out where the sharks were and I'd just have to hope that the guy holding me would pull me in in time um, so, so that I could concentrate on firing and getting some shots off of the sharks and uh, yeah thankfully they did they turned out to be very trustworthy and experts at what they did and I'm very grateful but yeah it wasn't long before I abandoned having wet sleeves all the time and got myself a pole to do this sort of image uh, which I definitely recommend. Um, that's the way to do these rather than uh, playing fast and loose with your arms. Because the thing with white sharks is, is you often can't see when um, where they're coming from. They're they're amazing hunters and they do mix up their strategies a lot. So a shark, for instance, that's been circling the boat the same way over and over again can suddenly come from underneath the boat and surprise you. So yes, um, I think a pole. And even then, um, it's often quite worrying whether or not you're going to keep your camera. So I definitely understand why um, GoPros have started to become a lot more widespread rather than uh, expensive SLRs and housings for doing this sort of shot. But anyway, um, I enjoyed trying to get these kind of shots and the thrill of it at the same time as uh, just trying to show a shark in its environment. And this is another sort of split shot. This was done in Aliwal Shoal. Um, this, is, this was done during the evening. And um, this is a sort of totally different approach to the last one. We were um, intentionally dipping over the side. We tried getting these sort of shots in the water. And then Alan Walker, who's a famous uh, underwater photographer over there, very well known one, um, he said, no, you should do these over the side of the boat. And that's what we did. And he was completely right because it enabled us to get this sort of shot. And um, I've always been quite happy with this one. Um, I think it's, quite a, it's got a, quite a lot of interest with the um, the gloomy sky and you've got the three sharks there and uh and the bubbles and just showing the commotion when they're around you trying to feed on scraps so i just wanted to show that one as an illustration compared to the last one and this is another ragged tooth shark in in uh, the cathedral i'm sorry to have a load of those but then um, i think these kind of shots they can illustrate some different ideas and this this is going to be about um, the context and the background of your images the area itself is quite picturesque with that arch there and also the other fish that you get and so whereas before the image was of the regatti shark close up and it was featuring it this time um, I'm doing what I like to do quite often and I'm showing the environment that the animals are in um, and with, with this one I was trying to get it to echo the arch and luckily it did eventually um, and so I hope that that shows you know, the environment that they're in a bit of context which then if you contrast with this shot this is exactly the same location but instead I'm lighting up the foreground more so if you go back with the board and look you're getting a lot more detail from the foreground of the environment that the sun tigers are in and I think it makes a very different shot so that's three different shots I think but using three quite different techniques um, to get different photos and contexts. Along those lines this is a tiger shark that was taken early well show and you tend to meet them in open water there um, and this was quite a gloomy day so the background is quite featureless so I really worked hard to bring out the detail of the shark itself. Um, 
because there really wasn't much going on. It was a bit gloomy um, and, as I say, in total open water, so, so there wasn't much you could use as a background. But obviously the animal itself, I think, is quite an a interesting and uh, eye-catching animal with the stripes. So I worked on that, whereas when you're in somewhere like the Bahamas, where the environment is different, much clearer water, you can get more of the environment in, maybe try to get more of the colours. Um, and so, yes, sometimes it is worth going to different places to do the same animals because you can get quite different shots. And often they behave differently too. I find that they're much more skittish in Aliwal Shoal than they are in the Bahamas, where again, I think they're more used to people. Um, there are sharks there we know by name in the Bahamas, whereas that hasn't happened for a while in South Africa, um, not since quite a few of them were, were caught in nets. And now we tend to see um, Sharks that maybe don't frequent the area so often in Aliwal Shoal as, as opposed to Tiger Beach in the Bahamas, where, as I say, lots of them are named and we know the sharks. This one, for instance, is Emma. And this is just another example of another thing you can do if you're, um, if you're trying to experiment with um, shark photography. The thing with shark photography is it's quite easy to just do a shark, as we saw on the slide before last, in nothing. And so often trying to get some sort of interest in the background or some context or something else going on with the image and so this one i've used reflections obviously to try and uh, try and make a more interesting shot than the shark just in just in just in the water and i hope it's successful um, with, the, with the reflection that again is a black tip and again more context this time deliberately showing um the dive itself that we were on so you can see the bait line and the other people participating and the other animals there um, I think sometimes it's good to do that um, it gives a little more information um, and also it can be a, a good idea commercially too because you can often sell these sort of shots to the operators um, but yes using a shard of light for instance um, and just all different techniques to show the sh to show the animal in different sort of lightings in di different contexts and different locations. You see here as well, I'm shooting up. It's often a good idea to shoot up at these animals. Um, and you've also probably noticed I usually use strobes on them. And um, here's another very close up one of a black tip. Um, but yes, um, thank you for listening. I hope there's been something of interest in all of that. Um, if you want to look at my photographs, I have many more of them on Instagram at harrystone underscore photo. And also if you want to email me to discuss anything, um, it's mail at harrystone.com. Uh, as I say, I've got a big catalogue of shark images. I didn't want to sort of go mad and bore you all senseless with one after the other of them tonight. But hopefully we've uh, discussed a few different aspects of why I do this and uh, how, how I do this. Okay, many thanks.